so I want to welcome you all to today's Rotman Dialogue with Hasok Chang. Um, I want to begin um, with our land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Chenomkin nations on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the dish with one spoon of government wampum. With this, we respect the long-standing relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. <coughs> we acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that indigenous peoples endure in Canada, and we accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our teaching research and community service. So it's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Hassock Chang to the Rotman Institute um, for a dialogue on his new book, Realism for Realistic People, a new pragmatist philosophy of science published in 2022 by Cambridge University Press. Hassock is the Hans Rousing Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. He works in a wide range of areas in history and philosophy of science, including the history and philosophy of chemistry and physics from the 18th century onward, philosophy of scientific practice, realism, pluralism, pragmatism, measurement, and evidence. Hassock has made seminal contributions to each of these research areas in the form of numerous articles and two, and now soon to be three, influential books, including Inventing Temperature, Measurement, and Scientific Progress, for which he won the Lakatosh Award in 2006, and Is Water H2O, Evidence, Realism, and Pluralism. In addition to his many and varied contributions to the literature and history and philosophy of science, Hassock has also made important contributions um, you know, he's all, also made history and philosophy of science a welcoming place for all of us, a welcome place for all of us to be. Um, he has um, done so much to support junior and international scholars in his roles as a governing board member of the Philosophy of Science Association, co-founder of the Society for Philosophy of Science and Practice, and a founding member of the Committee for Integrated History and Philosophy of Science, among many other leadership roles that he has held. So without further ado, I welcome you all to today's dialogue on Hassock's book. Hassock will first give a 15-minute overview of several chapters from his book, and then two of our own Rotman PhD students, Carlo and Kusick, who works in the philosophy of the mind, brain, sciences, and philosophy of emotions, and Todd Nagel, who works in, the, in general philosophy of science and philosophy of space-time physics, will then engage Hassock in a 45-minute discussion that I will moderate. This will be followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers from the audience. So let's begin. Welcome Hassock, and let's welcome Hassock. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you all for being here. Um, is it okay if I stand and talk? I can see you better in the back rows if I'm standing up. I'm gonna try my best to stick to the 15 minutes and you can cut me off at any point if you need to. So it, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time at the Rotman at Western. Um, I've, you know, always wondered about this place called London <laughs> while I was living in the other place called London, which I did for 15 years. And great to be here finally to enjoy this um, wonderful day with you all. I, I'm very glad I arrived yesterday and have had chances to talk to various of you about these themes that we're going to now cover more formally. And ju just as a short introduction to the book, um, I know many of you have read it extensively, others probably haven't, so I'm just gonna try to bring everyone to the same spot. And let me start with a complaint about a common ideal of knowledge which is really unrealistic in my view, right? So it's th this ideal starts with the assumption that there is such a thing as mind-independent external reality, and then the ideal is that we must make theories that correspond to that external reality, and that's what we call truth, the correspondence. And this ideal quickly unravels as soon as anyone starts examining the actual state of what we consider the best in our knowledge practices, namely modern science. So we start with the assumptions of 
independent reality and correspondence truth. And then, of course, we ask ourselves, does science as we know it achieve that ideal? And the answer, as many historians and sociologists and other people have pointed out, is no. And philosophers ourselves acknowledge that science doesn't reach that ideal. And then we get the backlash, right? Having put science on a pedestal, um, we have to admit that it doesn't deserve to be up there. And then people start saying, ah, but then what scientists tell us is just a theory and I'm free to believe it or not believe it. And I'm going to just believe my own opinion. So we're seeing a lot of this backlash and this is a problem. Right? And then scientific realists, so-called, try to defend the old ideal by going through different kinds of moves. One common move is to say, well, we were not saying scientific theories are really true. We're just saying they're approximately true. Or we go into a kind of selective realism. And to cut a long story short, I think that's really the wrong place to start. I think we should start from a new place. And there, I, one of the people who inspired me um, was Hilary Putnam, who said this once, right, in his book, little book on pragmatism. He said, to say that truth is correspondence to reality is not false, but empty, as long as nothing is said about what that correspondence is. So because we, everyone will admit that we don't have direct access to mind-independent reality, so what are we talking about when we say truth is correspondence to that reality. And there's the typical scientific realist move, which goes, well, but science is really successful. Therefore, it must be that we have correspondence. How does that inference work out? That's what the whole dispute about realism is about. right? And I think instead of starting with that starting point, we start from pragmatism. But before I go to that, You've probably all been used to this Tarski move, right? What we have in correspondence is what's expressed in this, this quotation scheme, right? Snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. And a lot, I, I've always been mystified by why this provides enlightenment or solutions to any problem. So to those who really like to invoke this quotation, I give them this. Does this help you? <laughs> so there's the time independent Schrodinger equation. That is true if and only if it doesn't help. Right? So where I like to start is what you saw in chapter three of the book, right? This idea of truth by operational coherence. And this is how I come down to, I mean, definitions are hard to deal with, but this is the, my best attempt. I say a statement is true to the extent that there are operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying on its content. Now, this needs a lot of just chewing over and explicating, so that that's partly what we're going to be doing today. Um, one thing that, right, one evocative statement that I've been inspired by comes from William James, who said, any, any idea upon which we can ride, so to speak, is true for just so much true in so far forth, comes from his book, Pragmatism. And that's vague, that's poetic, but I think it expresses something very important, which is what I'm trying to capture with my definition. And there are a few things to note about this conception of truth. First of all, I managed to write a whole book and publish it without going into if and only if. <laughs> but this is a weird definition. It says to the extent. People don't do that in philosophy, right? So what, what am I trying to express? And this is where I, I can go through this later, my conception of pragmatism, if you want. But I'm going to skip over that for now. And to just focus on what I'm saying here in that definition of truth by operational coherence. And to the extent that expresses that 
truth as I mean it here is a matter of degrees. It's not a binary, yes, no. And not only is it a matter of degrees on one dimensional spectrum, but it has many dimensions because operational coherence, which I'll come to more in a moment, is not a one dimensional quantity. It's not a quantity, it's a quality. So truth becomes a quality as well in that old fashioned robust sense of quality. Now, if truth is not a binary, truth and falsity is not a binary that does have important implications for logic. And it's an interesting exercise to think about what false means under this conception, which we can talk about. But people will understandably get very upset about this kind of notion of truth, right? And about the pragmatist notion of truth in general, People raise very often what I've called, even in the book, the witchcraft objection. Right? So if the people who believe in witchcraft can do a few things coherently, does it mean that their belief about witches is true? Now, I, what I don't know is whether any of the things that the witchcraft people did were coherent activities. I don't think so, but <laughs> I don't know enough about witchcraft. So I'm going to go to another example, which is flat earth theory, right? which I do know a little bit more about. So that's the flat earth picture of the earth. right? Maybe I'll just use my cursor to point right. And that is also the, the United Nations logo. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't know that the UN was founded by flat earthers. But <laughs> There it is. This example I, I take from Lee McIntyre, the philosopher of science who's been really concerned about science denial and such things. He says he really wanted to understand what drove the flat earth people. So he attended one of their conferences. I mean, they have academic conferences like we do. They give papers and they debate issues with each other. They're not just spouting a doctrine. They are actually doing <laughs> research and working out the empirical consequences of their beliefs. So he said, right, in this flat earth, uh, what, this is what Lee learned. In the flat earth, picture of the world, that's the North Pole in the middle. The South Pole is the big lie, right? There is no such thing as the South Pole. Have you been to the South Pole? I mean, even those who have been to Antarctica haven't usually been to the South Pole, right? So they say it doesn't exist. The South Pole, so-called, is the circumference of the Earth, right? And so it goes. And Lee said, right, so one of the things they believe is that the distance between the tip of South America and something like New Zealand is so vast, there could never be a direct flight between the two. Because <laughs> you'd have to stop and refuel. Couldn't go. So he said, all right. Uh, so he, he peeled off one of the flat earth guys and entered, got him to enter into a bet, right? Let's take that flight. Let's see if there is one. And there's apparently one, right, between Chile and uh, New Zealand. And so they made a plan. They set a bet. On the day of the flight, the flat earth didn't show up. So... <laughs> <laughs> The point of the whole story is that right, there are activities right, that we perform on the basis of our beliefs. And the flat earth belief says there can be no such activity as flying direct from Santiago to Auckland or whatever. Right? And these things we can test out by experience, of course. How else do we deal with beliefs? And we don't have to accept that the flat earth theory is true just because they can do a few things according to, on the basis of their beliefs. No, we push them, we say, right, but can you do this? Or you say, you can't do this, let's see if we can do it, right? That's the standard way in which we check the empirical cogency of our beliefs. And the same goes for flat earth theory as goes for general relativity. There's no reason why 
subscribing to a pragmatist theory of truth should open you to an extreme kind of relativism or just anything goes type situation. Now, a big note, uh, footnote I have to add about that conception of truth is that that's not the only thing we mean by truth, right? There are different things we mean by truth. Right away, you, you can distinguish uh, truth in the sense of telling the truth, right? Being honest, saying what you mean, well, saying what you're thinking, and truth of the kind that I, I'm thinking about. So truth by operational coherence is only one of the things we mean by truth. And um, one important distinction to make is this truth by operational coherence, which works from a direct confrontation with experience and what I call truth by comparison. Sometimes they say, yes, the truth of this statement consists in its agreement with other things that we regard as true. So, yeah. Global warming is true. Why? Because we already believe how to, uh, the, the cogency of our temperature measurement methods, and here are the data produced by those measurements. We're not directly checking global warming in the sense of truth by operational coherence usually, but we're checking it by comparison. So, um, just a quick run through operational coherence. What, what is it? It's a difficult uh, concept to, to define, but it's a really important concept in my way of thinking because the very notion of truth by operational coherence depends on it, and so does the notion of reality. And roughly speaking, uh, the idea of operational coherence is a fitting together of various elements and aspects of an activity, which is then conducive to the successful achievement of the aim of that activity. Right? Things have to fit together, even if I just want to take a swig of water. I'm not going to do this. There's a stunt I do in which I right, pour water all over me by aiming it at my chin rather than my mouth. There's that sort of incoherence that we can get into daily, right? The sign says, mind the step, and you don't pay attention when you're stumbling. All the way to the really complex coordination of theories, instruments, and calculations that you have in something like the GPS system, right? So in the end, uh, what I sum it up as is that operational coherence is aim-oriented coordination. Right. So that's the basic idea with which I also give you in chapter four, three of the book, a coherence theory of reality, according to which an entity is real, again, to the extent that there are operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying significantly on its existence and its presumed properties. So reality also then becomes a matter of degrees, and this is weird. And Todd's question is going, commentary is going to bring that up, and I will respond to it. But I think this is something we need to get used to, right? And I think there are very good reasons to get used to such a weird idea. But the main major worry will come up, right? So if you based the very notion of reality on something like operational coherence, which is framed in terms of our aims and our conceptions, don't we lose mind-independent reality? And the way I try to handle that worry is based on this distinction I make between mind control and mind framing, as I call it. So basically a Kantian insight, although it's Kant with wheel, Kant on wheels, as Michael Friedman Put it because the concepts change. But the basic Kantian insight is that we cannot even think, talk, deal with anything except by framing them in our own mental conceptions. Right? But that doesn't mean that things that we frame in such a way do what we like. So that the latter is what I call mind control. So in the end, I 
define real entities as things that are mind-framed, but not mind-controlled, at least not entirely. Figments of our imagination would be entirely mind-controlled, but um, not real things. So uh, lots of implications here as well, um, which we can, again, revisit uh, further in the discussion period. But not only does realness or reality become a matter of, again, degrees or quality, but this opens the door to a kind of ontological pluralism, which we can subscribe to without exposing ourselves to crazy kind of relativism. And I think that's good and that's fine. Right. So again, we can talk more about that um, in the discussion period. So finally, I, I just want to give you a brief take on what realism then means. So how I present the idea of realism is as this commitment to learning, commitment to empirical learning, Realism means we have an attitude about science and everything else in which we, we expose ourselves to situations in which we can learn the most, right? We don't just try to protect what we already believe. We create new activities. We try to extend ex existing activities to new domains. We're always confronting ourselves with more realities, some of which we even create through an engineering type process. So um, it's an extreme kind of empiricism, which is in the end how I see pragmatism. So there are interesting implications uh, of this way of looking at realism. One of which is that um, we really can talk in a sensible way again about scientific progress. And it's not progress towards the de destination, but it's a progress away from our current disturbed state, as John Dewey would have put it. And the other thing that pleased me when I worked it all out is that realism and empiricism come out now looking like pretty much the same thing. And now I think it was a crazy idea that realism and empiricism were presented as opposites. So um, let me stop there because the time is passing on and there's a lot more to say, but we want to hear from Kaderlin and Todd. Um, thanks so much, Asak. And I'd like to welcome Cardon to ask the first question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Asak, for this great book. Uh, first of all, it was uh, I really enjoyed reading it and uh, really enjoyed seeing this uh, coherent view uh, and well, well written also. So, my question. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with a question on chapter one. Uh, in chapter one, you're emphasizing the role of aim-oriented practices in acquiring, developing, and producing active knowledge. And while doing that, you also appreciate other forms of knowledge and their connections to different epistemic activities. Um, I'm quite sympathetic to this view myself, but someone might think that this blurs the distinction between engineering and science. Mm -hmm. And I'm won wondering whether you intentionally choose not to focus on theoretical uh, aspects of scientific practice where propositional knowledge seems to preserve its uh, centrality. If that was an intentional uh, act, so um, do you also think that active knowledge is more helpful in theory development also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, thank you. So I, I, I probably seem to really de-emphasize the importance of theory in this book. I do that only kind of as an antidote to the prevailing way of thinking about scientific knowledge, which is so theory-focused and propositional. Um, so no, I, I don't uh, want to de-emphasize theory in the end very much. Uh, the blurring of engineering and science, that is intentional. And that's partly because uh, this whole book came out of thinking about the kinds of knowledge that seem to be living on the boundary between engineering and science. So that, that's something I haven't finished, this uh, project on the history of batteries and all that led um, uh, came out from that. 
And I mean, for a long time, I resisted this notion that people like Latour called techno science because I, I was kind of a purist about science growing up. And I thought, no, engineering, we don't want to dirty our hands with that kind of thing. <laughs> but no, I, I think science and engineering really do work very closely together in a way that's ultimately inseparable. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming, but uh, first of all, um, it was a joy to read your book. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question from chapter three. Mm -hmm. And so here's, and I'm going to take the stance of uh, a, a standard scientific realist. Um, so here's the kind of thing that might happen in science. Uh, Maxwell's tinkering with the equations that, you know, later come to be called Maxwell's equations, and he discovers that he can unify optics and electrodynamics. Um, a correspondence theorist might be able to tell a story about that that says, well, there's really some underlying reality that both of these mind-independently framed domains are referring to. So the question is, how would you describe unification like that uh, in a pragmatist framework? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is a big question, and it's a question that gets at a really big issue, which is this kind of an explanationist demand from the scientific realist, right? The, the, the question that goes, right, how come our theories are so successful? How could they be so successful if they weren't true, right? And I think that they're, right, I'm going to try not to let this be a long discourse, but there are different levels uh, of question about explanation that we have to discuss. So there are some specific questions, like suppose you, you, you have a practice in which, right, you have a cathode vacuum tube and you got an electrode on one side and on the other side, and you heat up that electrode and you get what we call cathode rays, right? what we call now electrons, and they're received at the other end. And you say, right, how would this phenomenon be explainable if there weren't really things like electrons? Right? And I think that level of it makes perfect sense. But electrons are not in the noumenal, Kantian noumenal world. They're, they're, they're unobservable in the sense of not being perceivable to our our naked senses, but they're in fully in the phenomenal world of Kant, right? So this kind of causal explanation that we give within our world of experience, that makes perfect sense, and that also doesn't get you to scientific realism as people want. So then there's the kind of question you raised, yeah, wow, how, can, how come optics and electromagnetism more unifiable, right? If there isn't a unified thing out there, and now we're, we're, we're getting into the noumenal realm, right? But there are two ways this can go, right? One is to go the way Maxwell went, which is to say, yeah, we can explain this because there's the ether. Hmm. You don't want to go there if you're <laughs> more than scientific realist. But uh, ether aside, the point is that this kind of explanation, again, refers to something that's in the phenomenal world, like the ether. There, there's a particular unobservable kind of entity or property that, in a normal causal way, explain why we can do something like the unification of these two domains, right? Okay, so that also doesn't get you to what standard realists want. And then the, the other way to go goes like invoking God, right? There is this ultimate reality which is unified. And that's, then you enter into Putnam's territory where you go, how do we even access in any way that ultimate unified reality, right? So that becomes like explaining, oh, how come the world is so harmonious? <laughs> and you say, because God, the benevolent God, designed it that way. 
And then we, we can ask, right, does that really explain anything? And even worse than God, who at least has these specific properties like benevolence, when you say, right, the, the scientific theories work because there is the external world, in what sense does that explain anything, right? And what kind of theory of explanation are we invoking? And at that point, I think we just lose the plot, right? So there's a weird kind of intuitive satisfaction that people seem to derive from being able to say, oh, yeah, there is the external world. But I don't really see what that actually explains. Right? Uh, yeah, I think I'm convinced that the standard realist explanation or uh, however Maybe explanation is the wrong word, but they're, mm. the story they're telling there is probably problematic, I think. Um, so I think I agree with everything you said. <laughs> but I wonder what the pragmatists would say uh, mm -hmm. in place of that, or if they would just say there's nothing that calls for explanation. Right. So, so there are two pragmatist responses, right? One is to uh, reject the question, right, if it's meant in this hyper-metaphysical way. There is nothing to explain. These practices just work out. That's all we've learned. And if you ask, but why? Right, that's because I, uh, my um, predecessor at Cambridge, Peter Lipton, said he made his most major dis philosophical discovery at age six, <laughs> which is that whatever his mom would explain about something, he could just respond with, but why? <laughs> <laughs> So eventually, right, that has to stop somewhere. So our practices work. You could say that's thanks to the grace of God, but I mean, that's as far as we can take it. Uh, so that's one way to go for the pragmatist to, to reject that uh, demand for ultimate explanation. The other way to go is, as I was referring, we look for explanations in terms of other accessible things, right? So like Maxwell did. How come optics and electromagnetism have this unified presentation? Well, he explained it, right, by saying light is a wave in the ether. And it must, according to his theory, have this speed. Oh, guess what? That's the same as the measured speed of light. So you can seek that kind of a low road, right? Why do our practices work out? Well, there must be a good reason, but that good reason is in the realm of empirical activity. So that would be the pragmatist response, I think. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a question about the distinction you provide between uh, mind framing and uh -huh. mind controlling in chapter three. Uh, you characterize mind controlling as a direct and willful control over reality, whereas you state that mind framing is about I'm quoting this from uh, page uh, 71, mm -hmm. about our conceptualization of entities, there is a wholly different issue from mind control. Mm -hmm. It seems that you're inclined to draw a sharp distinction between the two notions, but I'm wondering whether we cannot attribute any mm -hmm. uh, mani manipulative role to mind framing in making sense of our practices, experiences, or actions. Yeah. in a way that uh, may threaten the, this mutually uh, exclusive characterization of mind framing and mind co controlling distinction. So the yeah. thing is that you're saying that our aims, our um, goals and desires uh, uh, shapes the way, shapes our ex scientific practices. And at the same time, you're saying that mind, we cannot mind frame things in mm. the way we want, but, but you're accepting that uh, I, our purposes shape the way we uh, frame things for the purposes of scientific practice. So do you think that there's a, also, this is a kind of a different question relatively, uh, do you think that there's a room for unconscious processes which might be a gray area between the two? Like uh, even if we don't intentionally want mm. to uh, frame some our experiences in particular ways, there might be something that we can frame our experiences yeah. in a way that we want it 
uh, to see that way. So, I mean, to, to that last point first, I think a lot of mind framing is unconscious, right? I, I don't think uh, we can entirely consciously decide the way we want to conceive of things, right? So I think that's natural. Um, but the question you ask about uh, whether mind control and mind framing are completely separable, that, that's a harder one and a very important one to address. And so there's there a few different things I want to point to. One is that, okay, so there's, sometimes there are situations where Ian Hacking's idea of looping does apply, right? And that's when, when the thing you're trying to frame has a mind of its own, <laughs> responds to the framing. Okay, so in the realm of human sciences, uh, that certainly happens. That still doesn't give you full mind control on either side, but yeah, looping does happen. And then there is engineering, right? I mean, we do make stuff. This is another thing that hacking like to emphasize, sometimes experiments are intended um, to create new phenomena, right? And this is one of the most exciting things that science and engineering do. So in that case, yeah, not only do we conceptually frame the stuff, but we are actually creating them. Uh, and I think that that has to be recognized as an important aspect of what we do. But even then, even the stuff we make don't do as we wish. Right? So still there, there's not complete um, mind control there. And um, I mean, there, there's another uh, pluralist point here. There are different realities that become realized, if you want, in different activities. And we do have a choice about what kind of activities to engage in, so that has a pluralist consequence. And a lot of these things, uh, again, come up in that study that I'm currently finishing up about the history of batteries and so on. So uh, electric circuits, they don't really exist in nature. Right? Electric circuits only came into being when Volta made the battery and somebody had the idea of connecting the two ends with a wire. Oh, now we have a steady current flowing through the circuit and boom, some years later we have Ohm's law. We have this new, wholly new conception of current voltage and resistance and that became the fundamental way in which we conceive of all electrical and then magnetic phenomena. Right, so none of that domain of reality would have come into being if Volta hadn't invented the battery. Still doesn't mean we mind control these things, but there's a clear sense in which, yes, uh, not only are we mentally framing things by conceptualizing them, but we are actively creating realities. And that's not the kind of constructivism we should worry about, right? Yeah, I, I just have a quick follow-up, maybe not so much related, but uh, on, on that point, I'm wondering uh, whether can you differentiate your view from conventionalism? You're doing that in, in the book, you're mm -hmm. by saying that it, it's mind framing is not a uh, arbitrary, no, uh, it's not right. a matter of arbitrary choice. But at the same time, it seems that uh, we can um, accept the, uh, some form of conventionalism in terms of uh, the way we frame uh -huh. things. Uh, yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. I mean, there are different senses of conventionalism, right? Yeah. So um, one sense I pick up from your comment is, yes, there is some kind of arbitrariness in the way we do mind framing, right? And I think that's right. Uh, there's at least a contingency in choice, but I think that kind of arbitrar arbitrariness will be reduced in the end when we then use the framed 
things to do activities. I see. Right. So that that's the the in the long run, every conception is subject to an empirical test, and that's what I see as the heart of pragmatism. Right. So yeah, I, at least temporarily, there's going to be a lot of conventionality um, or arbitrariness, but it will eventually be brought to a realm in which it can be empirically tested. Um, and then there's the sense of conventionalism as meant by Poincaré, and that's very different. And I think we can also understand that in a nice pragmatist way, because Poincaré's thing is, well, you start with what looks like a really uh, robust empirical regularity, and then you raise it to the st status of convention, by which he means we no longer question it, we no longer treat it as something empirically testable, right? But in the end, even those conventions will be subject to new tests when we reach out into previously unexperienced domains, right? So, um, yeah, we, we had things like Newton's second law, which had become conventions in the Poincarian sense, and then they were also eventually tested and, and in some cases discarded and modified. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm sorry for jumping around, but you mentioned this question, so I feel like I should ask it before we uh -huh. <laughs> um, So this is from both chapter three and four. Uh, you argue that there's degrees to reality and to truth. Um, and so the, I was with you when you were talking about the, the pluralism of truth, um, but the degrees is kind of hard for me to picture what you're talking about. So one of the examples you use is of the Loch Ness Monster. You say, uh, we should say that there is some reality to the monster since some activities involving the monster will be quite coherent if there is a Nessie-like creature or a good visual effect mimicking it. So I wonder why the degrees come in. It seems like either there's a monster or there's a visual effect or, you know, maybe some other option. Yeah, thank you, Todd. You, uh, you, you, you put your finger on something, uh, a distinction that I should have made much more clearly, and in retrospect, I see I didn't. So that's a... It's a good thing I, I get an opportunity to um, make that distinction on tape. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two different things get, that can go on. And the, the main thing I had in mind with degrees of reality is that, yeah, it can happen, and it usually happens, really, that not all activities involving the entity in question are fully coherent, right? So some activities are, others are not. So you can ask, I mean, there are, I think lots of entities in really good science are like this, so you, you can't say that they are just real simpliciter, right? So think about Newtonian point-like particles. Are those real? Well, I, I think they are in many senses because they're, lots of things like planets to which we can apply Newtonian mechanics and do really coherent things with. But in other ways, if you assume that Saturn is a point particle, lots of activities are going to also fail, right? If you get close enough to it, or you realize, hey, it's just gas. Um, what about phonons? Right. Are those real? What about the placebo effect? What about Bitcoin? What about, right? There are lots of examples like this which show that, yeah, um, these, each of these entities support a lot of coherent activities and then they don't support some others that you might like to do if they are real. So that, that's the main thing I was trying to express, right, when I said, yeah, uh, reality is not a, a yes-no binary. And no, there, there are different degrees to which something, an activity can be coherent. But there's another thing that happens, which is that it may be that the meaning of the concept or statement in question is imprecise. 
right? And that, I think, is what happens with Nessie, uh, Loch Ness Monster. What, what exactly is it we're talking about? And then you point out, yeah, but you could just disambiguate the thing. Are we saying that there really is a dinosaur-like creature in the lake? Or are we just saying that people have these visual perceptions of a long-necked thing? Or are we saying what? Are we saying there's a fish that may appear to have a neck? It's not clear, right, what people mean. So you might say, well, so in that case, um, can't we just make the meaning precise? And then we would have a yes, no binary. And the difficult thing about that is that fixing meaning completely is really not easy, right? I mean, you might say, well, can't we define it? Definitions don't completely fix meanings, right? So I, I have a late Wittgensteinian sense of meaning uh, there. Meaning has to be, right, if you want a complete meaning of a concept, it has to encompass all the activities that you can do involving that idea, right? You're never going to have all the activities figured out. So there's a sense in which meaning is always going to be imprecise, which means that both truth and reality in my senses um, are always going to be not completely sharply de de determined. Right? So two different things, but they point to <laughs> the same kind of conclusion. Yeah. So the idea is that the, the um, concept itself is kind of comes into being. Because, it, or it doesn't apply, uh, it applies in the group. Uh, do you mean concept like the Loch Ness yeah, yeah. Monster? Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, I mean, uh, the, one, the second thing I was talking about is that at least most concepts we deal with in empirical science are not precisely defined, right? Then none of the sentences involving that concept could really have just yes, no truth value, right? How can a sentence without the determinate meaning have a truth value? So that, that's one thing that happens. But the other thing that happens is, even if you imagine the concept itself to be precisely meaningful, there, there will still be this other thing that it can be involved in different kinds of activities, which will be coherent to different degrees, right? Then to say overall, is the entity designated by the concept real? That question is not going to have a simple yes, no answer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I get tangled up thinking about that one. Yeah, I'm indecisive right now, like which one should I ask? But um, so I'm gonna have a question on uh, chapter three mm -hmm. again. So you criticize um, what you call as legoist, uh, legoist. legoist uh, yes, metaphysics, yes. according to which Physical mm -hmm. composition is a simply uh, assembly of uh, unchangeable units in a manner of building mm -hmm. uh, blocks uh, with Lego bricks. And mechanistic explanations and one of the prominent philosophical uh, frameworks for thinking about the nature of explanation in uh, mind-brain sciences also aim to specify component parts and relations between the parts of mm -hmm. a phenomenon in order to uh, provide an explanation of it. The legoist approach seems to endorse similar commitments to mechanistic explanations, though. So, do you think that your rejection of legoism can also be interpreted as a criticism of explanatory power of um, yeah. mechanistic explanations? This is a very good question. And right. <laughs> I'm also wondering whether you think that you also endorse pluralism in terms of uh, explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Wow, that's a yeah. <laughs> huge other question which we may <laughs> come to. Right. I mean, what, what I should say uh, as background is that what I mean by Legoism is stronger than the very basic kind of reductionist ontology which says stuff, things are made up of other things, right? 
because I, I do think things are made up of other things, but Lego is a means that the building blocks are unchangeable, mm -hmm. right? And I think some mechanistic stories go like in a, a, in a Legoist way, right? But I don't think that's very good scientifically, right? So part of what I go through in the book is this realization about physics. Atom smashing is not Legoist. Molecular constitution is not Legoist. It may seem that way, but only if you ignore the energy changes, right? So when you pull neutrons, electrons, and protons together to make an atom, those things don't precisely exist in the atom as they did when they were separate, right? Because any assembly like that in microphysics results in either an emission or absorption of energy. So you've actually added or subtracted stuff when you put two elementary particles together. And I think it goes like that everywhere. Uh, so if you look naively at something like a biochemical pathway um, in physiology, it may look Legoist. But no, again, only if you ignore the fact that energy changes are happening when molecules transform into other molecules or when two of them come to form a bigger molecule or when one breaks up into smaller ones. So I, I think there are actually hardly ever Legoist physical situations. Mm -hmm. uh, so if me mechanist explanations invoke a kind of causation which leaves the constituent parts of things completely intact, then I think that's probably scientifically not that good. Mm -hmm. That would be my guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in other words, I think true mechanism should not be Legoist. I think that's what we've learned from fundamental physics, if we've learned anything from fundamental physics. And as for uh, explanatory pluralism, I mean, the short answer is yes, I, mm -hmm. I think. There are many different things we can legit legitimately mean by explanation, right? And I think that's just the way it is because explanation is a vague word that, that applies to really various kinds of uh, understanding or various kinds of mental satisfaction we can have about um, by learning something, right? But it isn't going to be just all one type, I think. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're getting close to time, so. Um, I plan to stay 40, 45 minutes, okay. but we, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's because I talked too much, <laughs> so. Um, in the third chapter, uh, you say that it's difficult to make sense of the claim that the world as, mm. as a whole entity um, is real because there isn't anything that we can do with the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I, I think that's right, but I was just wondering if there was a way to get in here. Um, someone might, if uh, making sense of something is mm -hmm. a scientific activity that mm. we might do, I could imagine an argument where someone says we need to invoke the whole world to make sense of something local. Yeah, so... And it would be a legitimate thing I, to do. <laughs> uh -huh. I think true to my pragmatism would be to say, let's see <laughs> <laughs> if there are actual situations in which the invocation of the whole external world does help us. I haven't found one, but yeah, it is an open question. And in that case, we might think, okay, Maybe this concept is empirically meaningful, but uh, so that's the thing about uh, the, the a thoroughly empiricist perspective that my kind of pragmatism gives you, right? Even the question of what is empirical is empirical. We have to see if there are actual experiences and activities that we can engage in with this notion of the world, 
Now, I, I don't think there is one, but I, I'd be open to surprise. <laughs> So um, I'd like to go back to the uh, notion of unification mm. uh, in science, but from a different perspective, oh, yeah. maybe. Uh, so, um, so it seems that your uh, scientific pluralists often find the ideal of uni unified science to be untenable, and your claims throughout the book seem to uh, support this position. And actually, you said that this is not the. Uh, uh, not even a problem, maybe, to to be uh, to mm. uh, unify uh, all the sciences. And notably, you provide an explanation concerning the existence of uh, diverse frameworks within a particular scientific discipline, mm -hmm. and suggest that as long as the scientific practices within those frameworks uh, proceed in an operationally coherent way, there is no harm in treating each mm -hmm. of them to be true. Yeah. Th that's so far so good, but what do you think about whether and how communication between different scientific disciplines can be maintained in a meaningful way when yeah. such a diversity exists in terms of theory choice, experimental uh -huh. pro procedures and research models? Yeah, this is a really important uh, practical question, right, for how we get on in inquiry. And I think there are diff different ways in which this happens. One is we can have shared tools and even whole languages between very different disciplines. So, you know, there are some things that have really settled down through the history of science. So something like the calculus. I mean, that's really used in a diverse array of places. Now, what about the periodic table? <laughs> I mean, without the periodic system of elements, a lot of sciences would really struggle. And on the other hand, because we're all using the periodic table, that gives us a way to immediately find points of contact between very different disciplines. So that's one. Another is what um, comes from Otto Neurath, and I don't know if I put that one in the book, but. When he talks about the unification of science, he says, I, I don't really mean unification. So why did you use that word? <laughs> uh, he talks about it as the orchestration of the sciences. And what he really has in mind is in order to solve spe specific problems, you need to bring different fields together. So his example, which I always cite, is to put out a forest fire. Right, you need to bring in the physics of fire, you need to bring in the chemistry of combustion, you need to bring uh, plant science because you think about what burns, you need to think about forest ecology, you need to bring in economics and political sociology to think about how to organize a fire brigade to go and put out the fire. So he says, to solve a, any specific real life problem, you're really going to have to integrate the sciences that deal with mm -hmm. different aspects. So that's what I think of as the focused, task-focused uh, integration. And then one other kind of thing that we have is really a shared experience, right? So. Priestley and Lavoisier could talk intelligently to each other because they were performing the same experiment, which they could describe with this shared language that's at the ground level, right? So, yeah, a cup is a cup, and a lens is a lens with which you focus sunlight. You all understand these things in the same way, even though you are incommensurable about phlogiston and oxygen. So that kind of shared experience that you can describe in a shared language, the same kind of things you smell, the same kind of calculations you perform. So th those things also provide linkages. Yeah, mm. like just mm. one quick note uh, or follow up. <laughs> and I was wondering while asking these questions, like would uh, allowing such diversity mm -hmm. uh, with, with, the com uh, with the commitment to pluralism mm -hmm. would contradict whether would it contradict with pragmatic 
uh, approach you are taking because uh, such di diversity mm. may be a, uh, may be, may create problems in in uh, in terms of the communication between sciences. Mm -hmm. So in the first place, would it be uh, useful to uh, adopt that kind of uh, variety in, mm. in the in the first place? I think there would be you know emergency situations where immediate action is required mm -hmm. when you just need to agree on one plan of action and do it. Um, I think in scientific research, it's probably not that common to have that sort of situation. But you know, if, if, if there is a meteor about to hit the Earth, yeah, we would just have to agree on one approach and pursue that. Um, I think you know, in, in general society, in democratic politics, we have learned how to deal with this, right? So yeah, people can go into wartime footing if there is an actual war and just agree to set aside differences. You might even suspend an election, whatever. But you know that this is only for emergencies. And then when the emergency is over, you go back to squabbling and <laughs> negotiations and multi-party elections and all that. So I think this is something we need to also learn how to do in science, yeah. right? And I, yeah, when something like the pandemic hits, yeah, you have to just go with one plan, even if you know that it may not be the best plan. But I think such cases are pretty rare and we can learn how to deal with it. So that's not an argument for not having pluralism in general. And you could say, well, no, in, during peacetime or non-emergency situations, you need to just maximize your learning through this pluralistic way of learning so that when the emergency comes, you have all the possible tools at your disposal. I see. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, I think some answers to this question might have come out already, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh -huh. um, the very first line of the book, you say that the aim of the book is to develop a realistic philosophy, philosophical vision for scientific <laughs> yeah. knowledge. Um, and I think the sense of realistic there is one that can actually be achieved. Um, do you think that scientists already act in the ways that you're describing in the book? Or do you th is this more of a description for the ways they should be? Yeah, so <laughs> this is the descriptive versus normative question, which I love <laughs> in general. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, what I would say is that what I'm proposing is normative, but in, not in a foundationalist kind of way. I'm not saying that these are principles by which we should live, and I know that these are the correct principles. I'm saying that, well, they're more like proposals. Let's try living in this way, see how it works out. So. That's pragmatism again. And as I see it, pragmatism is a reflexive doctrine, right? So if you ask me, why should I be pragmatist? My answer is going to be, because I found it a good way to think about things, right? I'm not going to tell you God gave me pragmatism. I'm not going to even say that all other doctrines are wrong. I'm just going to be open, right? It's again an empiricist attitude. So um, normative principles, I think, are in a weird way hypotheses, right? Let, let's try doing stuff in this way and let's see what the fruits are, right? But one thing to note is that the, the sharp distinction between the normative and the descriptive, I don't think works out because normative proposals are only likely to work out if they're not too disconnected from how things actually are practiced, right? You can, you can put up all kinds of really unrealistic proposals. People are just not going to be able to cope with them. Right. So what I've tried to do concerning science is, first of all, I, I've tried to get a pretty accurate sense of how scientific practices go 
but I'm not looking at any, right? I, I'm not looking at the witchcraft people or the flat earthers or the climate change conspiracy theorists. No, I'm looking at what we pre-theoretically judge to be good practices in science. So there's already normative judgment. Then I'm trying to get a good descriptive sense of how those practices go, right? And then I, I'm going to make a more considered kind of normative proposal about how these practices can go even better, right? So the normative and the descriptive work with each other in, in this kind of iterative way, and they can't be really sharply separated. So to go back to the question as you now put it, yeah, I think what, what I'm sketching is fairly close to how science actually works out. But I'm certainly going to be seeing places where at least some scientists deviate from the kind of ideal that I'm proposing. So that, that's a kind of a wishy-washy answer, <laughs> but that's where I think we are. Thank you. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, one more, or we, we can. Yeah. So we have um, two two minutes. So I. Oh, well, what? Okay. Do you, do you want to do either of you want to have a last question or should we turn it over to the audience? I don't know if I can say a question in two minutes. So. Okay, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, so let's, yeah, so let's, I, let's, let's thank Carla and Todd and, and talk so much for each other. And, and now we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Oh, <laughs> uh, a lot of things were up at once. They were all in the session. Oh, okay. You and then after you're done. Yeah, you go first. Your hand went up. Um, now, I'm not sure if an example like this actually exists, but I was wondering about like an anti-witchcraft example where mm -hmm. um, there's a there's something that scientists believe to be true, but actually runs contradictory to a lot of other theories or ways of being. And, I was thinking maybe an example would be like relativity, mm -hmm. uh, where we don't we don't act as if time is relative. We right. act as if it's linear and fixed. Yeah. And and, uh, and knowing it, even if it is true, actually contradicts a lot of the ways that we behave. Mm -hmm. um, and and is that a counter example for the pragmatist? Like we, you know, if like can you really say right. that this is real or true? And, yeah. Yeah. It would be, except my pragmatist is pluralist, right? So yeah, you, you're absolutely, I shouldn't say absolutely, and when we discuss relativity, <laughs> you are very correct uh, when you say, yeah, there's the theory of relativity, but even the physicist who is fully signed up to the theory of relativity behaves in daily life as if time's just absolute, and, right, uh, in the Newtonian way. But I think that's okay. And it, it, again, reminds me of Arthur Eddington's thing about the two tables, right, where, where Eddington says, right, there are really kind of two tables in front of me. One is this hard, solid object of daily life, which I can lean on and write on, and I know what it's like. The other is what modern physics tells us, which is that it's mostly empty space. The swarm of these elementary particles, and it says, well, which of these is real? And it says, both are real. And this is the thing that it's very hard to accept um, for mo many philosophers, but I think this is something we have to learn to accept, right? Because that's how we live. And we have good reasons to have something like theory of relativity, particle physics, anything esoteric that we have. There are good reasons because there are lots of activities we can't do without such theories. Right. But that doesn't mean that we're going to throw out the conceptions of medium sized dry goods of everyday life or the earth being quite solid 
and so on, right? Because we have a form of life for lots of activities that rely on that notion. And if we have to say that the tables and the solid earth aren't real, then what could we say is real, right? So I think um, that, that's how the pragmatists would have to deal with it. Hi, thanks. Hey. Um, I actually wrote down my question. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, uh, well, actually, it's two questions put together, but the first one you, you kind of answered. But I'm going to ask you anyway. Okay. <laughs> so the, the first question would be something like, uh, what is the relation between your theory and participatory reasoning? Like the cubist type realism that uh, Chris Fitz talked about. Do you know something about that? And uh, um, um, the second question is kind of build up on this first one. So, what is like when, when pressed with this question, what is real, or perhaps in your case, it would be more proper to ask what is the most real thing, or what is very, very, very real. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when I when, when prompted with this question, curious tend to answer, well, form rule is real. So, mm. this kind of decision making rule is what's like real, real. So again, in context of what you're talking about, perhaps this question should be reframed something like, uh, is there like a, the rule or a rule which pushes us to, to, to mind frame things in a way we do? Is there something very, very basic or something which we would call the most real thing or a very, very real thing? What would that be? Right, so um, I mean, I, I would, Concerning things like Born's rule, I would rephrase the question in terms of truth rather than reality, because I mean reality I apply to entities. So if we've got a rule that is a statement, then I would be asking about the truth. Um, the most true statement would be one that can support a huge number of different activities, all of which work out coherently, right, in a diverse array of domains, right? So that would sort of approximate the old idea of a universally applicable law of nature, right? So I don't deviate that much in intuitive terms from, from that notion. And I mean, what, what we've found in physics, I think, in actual physics, is that there are no such rules or laws that we have found in history, right? And you now have a lot of physicists saying, look, guys, everything is an effective theory. We're not going to have universal applicability throughout the energy scale or in any other sense of universality. So that's my own sense of how things are. And the pragmatist answer to the abstract aspect of your question is that it's an empirical question. Which rules or entities are going to turn out to be extremely true or real, right? And I don't know enough about participatory realism to really comment on that, but we can maybe, you can tell me afterwards uh, what that is. Thanks, thanks for the great discussion. Um, <laughs> I was about to, like, I had a question in my mind, which is dangerous because the answer to this question might have the phone, if I only for propositional, but yeah. now let me rephrase it, and I want to exchange our opinion. The question is, um, following Todd's question about degrees of reality, I was thinking uh, of what helps, to some extent, characterize those degrees. For example, uh, from the discussion, I, I, I think I learned something, some factors which help understand the degree. For example, uh, the degree should be theory, theory dependent, Theory, some theory should provide the context to think about the ontological commitment of, of entities we want to study. And then 
in my sphere, like you talk about the quantum level, the thing would be different, and also kind of theory, theory related. Mm -hmm. And also, it should be related to the activities you are considering you want to make uh, by your engineering activities. And also, it might be um, 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 maybe related to the uh, levels of coherence. In coherence, because one theory can be mm -hmm. more, more coherent than the other. Mm -hmm. So that helps define why there is a degree of uh, reality. And now, if I have this in mind, and now think about some practice in science. That is, um, if we want to study some um, 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 celestial body in the universe, for example, the black hole, the frontier of reacting sciences, and we have different groups of scientists, like math math mathematical physicists, or physicists, or astrophysicists, or even those chemical uh, physicists. Mm -hmm. They want to study different aspects of it. And now, we want to do some project. NASA has some project for it. And we need to have different groups of people to cooperate or communicate. Of course, they have different understanding of black hole. They have different degrees of the uh, reality of the thing they call black hole even though they don't have a unique answer to the same thing. Mm -hmm. and now need, but they, they have the urban task to cooperate. So that there is a question they need to communicate with each other to confirm kind of uh, the existence of the entity in their different understandings. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which um, they have a, they can kind of develop a connection between different understandings. Mm -hmm. in, maybe in like other topics we call approximations, right? We, we go from one theory, we study some uh, kind of definition or characterization, and we say that, well, the other theories that characterization is approximate to this notion. And we kind of provide the underlying um, mechanism to say the connection between different things. Um, so, sorry, it's more like a sharing my opinion. <laughs> And so, so, so this would be a problem for if people strongly believe in the incommensurable uh, scalability, right? So yeah. that's so, also the question, can they really have proof of communication? Yeah, so that, that I mean, I, I'm going to refer back to the response I gave to Cardinal's question about communication, right? So even if we have a situation of incommensurability, which I think we often do, there are ways of communicating, there are ways of integrating um, different systems in order to right, satisfy specific purposes. And I think a, a lot of scientific work is about looking for those points of contact. And um, something like black holes, right? I mean, it's wide open because, right, we, we're still working out in each of these sciences you mentioned how exactly to deal with black holes and that that's, makes a very productive place for engagement and each discipline will hopefully uh, take something positive away from that experience of trying to communicate with other disciplines. So I, I think it's a good situation. Some people may despair about it, but there's no reason to despair. You, you should despair only if you think there's going to be a unified theory of everything, at least concerning one domain. But there often isn't, and that's quite OK. right? And I go back to the GPS example, which I love. <laughs> GPS only works so beautifully because they are bringing together specific aspects of Newtonian mechanics, quantum mechanics, general and special relativity, as well as these different instruments and procedures. And there's no unified theory of GPS. I don't think there ever is going to be. But it's one of the amazingly um, coherent things that we have in life. I'm going to keep my question short. It's mm. just a simple question. <laughs> is, is race real? So this is a like, tangential question, yeah. because if you look at the practices of social scientists, mm -hmm. they use the category of race to describe, like, for example, yeah. epidemiology. They say if you belong to a certain kind of 
race A or race B, there's a st statistical percentage that certain things, that you'll have certain diseases, 50%, let's say, diabetes or 20% mm -hmm. heart attacks. So now, given the operational coherent activities of social scientists yeah. using the category of race, it's probably would tend to say that the race is real. But then there are normative implications for such views. So I'm just curious whether you yeah. consider these kind of examples. In yeah, 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 yeah. So two things to say. One is that there are going to be normative implications of any epistemic decisions we make, right? So the question of race isn't unique in that. To the question of is race real? I mean, according to my concep conception of reality, race is kind of real. It's sort of halfway real, right? It's not real like electrons. It's not completely unreal like the Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. But I, I think race is halfway because there are very meaningful operationally coherent things you can and probably should do with race, like certain medical studies or interventions, as you were referring to. And then there are lots of things that we that are incoherent that people have tried to do with race, right? And then there's another complication, which goes back to my answer to you, Todd. It's a very, very imprecise concept, right? The meaning of race has never been precisely defined by anyone, really. So we're going to be dealing with this uh, situation in which even if everything you do with it works out coherently, still going to be hard to say for sure whether it's real. So I think it is one of these, I, I would put it somewhat under the placebo effect. Not that real, but it's not unreal. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so thanks, first of all, for coming. It's been terrific. Uh, Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up. It's, uh, I wanted to probe the notion of coherent activities relying on certain yeah. claims. And this is a way of doing it was brought up by Owen's question. So rather than thinking about relativity as being in conflict with sort of common sense notions of time, mm -hmm. I think one possible response is to instead say, our reliance on ordinary notions of space and time is imprecise insofar as we rely on notions of space and time, they're not actually the Newtonian notion. <laughs> um, we were wrong to think all of the things that Newton said about space and time were correct. In fact, you know, as you mentioned GPS, if we pull out our phones and see where we are on Google Maps, we're not in some sense relying on Newtonian notions of space and time in order to avail ourselves of that technology. So there seems to be an option here of saying, um, our theory, our previous theory, didn't adequately characterize the sense in which we're relying on something um, hmm. as part of organizing our, our coherent activities. And so, to my mind, that points out that we often probably aren't very good at identifying what we're really relying on. <laughs> so, so I think yeah. a pragmatist could just say, well, that's something for further investigation, yeah. right? Rather than saying, we have a clear sense that there's what we're relying on this domain, and then we changed that in a different domain. Instead, maybe we weren't right about what we were relying on in the first domain. Mm. So is that an appealing? So I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, I mean, you, you raise a very important meta-level question, right? Are our descriptions of activities themselves correct, mm -hmm. right? And you anticipated the pragmatic pragmatist answer, which some people would consider Weasley. Uh, yeah, that also is an empirical question. And um, I mean, in, in the reality of practice, it's a very difficult thing to know for a practitioner why their stuff works, right? So, you know, one of my favorite examples is William Herschel thinking that with the prism, he had separated rays of light and rays of heat, which is what he thought he was doing when he discovered infrared radiation, right? 
heat node. In the dark space bit beyond the red end of the spectrum, there were only rays of caloric hitting the thermometer. Uh, so yeah, heat without light makes perfect sense. So if you take that seriously, then we're in a very different place from what we think now Herschel had got to in 1800, right? So what we attribute um, the coherence of our activities to, that itself is certainly an open empirical question, right? And we may be doing it well, we may not be doing it so well. And that meta level question is also an empirical question. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a there's a separate question that I was curious about, which is just uh, in thinking about analyzing the coherence of activities. Um, do you think that there's a sort of general way of answering this, or is this always going to be domain specific? So this comes back to, in response to Carla, when you said you sort of de-emphasize theories in this book partly because of the overemphasis mm -hmm. on theoretical reasoning in other contexts. So I can imagine for some kinds of activities, you might just not have appropriate level of theorization. And so you're really looking at is an experimental practice coherent? You might not have much theoretical background. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, I would think the assessment of coherence is partially done through the theoretical background that's available to you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see if that's if that's compatible with your view or and, and if it would all boil down to sort of very domain specific questions. So the neuroscientists are asking, are their activities coherent with regard to some background views of neuroscience? The physicists are asking, are there activities coherent with respect to some right. of physics and so on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first thing to say is I certainly don't mean to exclude theory yeah. from playing a role in our activities. Right. I don't think we should overemphasize that role, but there is certainly a role. The second thing to say is that um, Coherence, as colloquially uh, understood, is a very broad notion. And what I mean by operational coherence is more specific, right? So operational coherence is always going to be defined by reference to the aim of an activity, right? So we could, you know, vaguely colloquially say, yeah, this theory is quite coherent with another theory. But in my sense, that doesn't work, right? We have to specify, right, what are you trying to achieve by linking up the two theories or by working with them both, right? And without that aim specified, I can't say whether there is coherence or not, right? So, so that, that's, um, if you want, a limitation of my account, but I think it's actually helpful to be able to pin down coherence, right? And I mean, I'm proposing this operational coherence as a, an important criterion by which we can judge the goodness of activities, right? The same way we might want to insist on consistency, right? Logical consistency when we are trying to have a criterion for judging the goodness of a system of propositions. So that, that's sort of the equivalent right. thing. Yeah. Let's thank, let's thank Hasak, Cardolin, and Todd so much for this great discussion. Thank you.